But yeah, I guess we can get started. So hello, everyone, and welcome to, I guess, this week's edition of the R Insurance webinar series from the R Consortium. And today we have a, let's say, short introduction into R performance culture, I guess, um, at least how I think about the uh, code performance in R. Maybe taking some of the um, well, introduction part or some background part. See, as already mentioned, it is the third part of the R and insurance or R insurance webinar series, which is called R Performance Culture. Next week, we have another piece that is, uh, I think, somewhat related, but uh, looks at a particular component of it with some example. More broadly, I think the first two pieces were delivered by my colleague here, George Spakalukas or George. And George and I work for Swiss Re, an actual control, which is part of Swiss Re's uh, group risk management. And maybe seeing it here, well, I guess we both work for Swiss Re at the moment. Uh, the, the views that we express here today or the content of this um, presentation is just for information for you and not any official view of the three or related entity. With that, um, yeah, as a brief introduction, just keeping it short, um, I'm Benedict Schamberger. I've worked for, well, for the three for a number of years now, eight or so, and uh, recently joined the model development and analytics team, which is also, I guess, the slightly infamous atelier program where you can also read an interview about online that uh, George is setting. I've been using R since I guess my university days where I very much had a sort of statistics and uh, quantitative finance and actual science background. With that I'd also hand it over to George briefly for a short introduction. Hello everyone, uh, this is George Bakolukas. I've been in Swiss Re for 15 years now, relatively new to R. Brief introduction at the university, never used it for several years, and then suddenly by chance came across it six, seven years, and the way it transformed my workflow from Excel to R was something that was very, uh, 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 very, very rewarding experience. And hopefully now with the sponsorship of Philip Long, our group chief actually were able to, to share that experience with others internally and with the help of our consortium who we hope to connect with the wider uh, industry and share experience and knowledge. Thank you very much, Benedict. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think as uh, additional background, well, I guess we, the two of us have the honor to you presenting you today a bit of the content or a bit of, well, some slice of work that we do. I think we're also backed by a very strong R community across the three. So in our so-called atelier community, so people who interact with uh, R coders and the content they produce and so on, probably several, well, more than a thousand people, definitely. And also we have a few hundreds, 500 or so actual R coders at um, the three. So there's a strong community there. And the example, some of the background of what we shared today it relates to something that is called experience studies. So I think as a basic premise of um, insurance, often um, as an insurance company, you offer a contract to um, someone who then becomes a policyholder. And uh, yeah, you don't really know what's going to happen over the next, let's say, year or so to that policyholder and uh, how much they're going to utilize that insurance contract or not. So you come in with some assumptions of what's likely going to happen. But a year or so later, you then essentially take stock of what did actually happen. And clearly not only over a single person, but over what you call a portfolio. So over all the different uh, policies or insurance contracts that you had written for a particular, let's say, region, such as uh, the UK or Germany or so in a particular line of business. So I guess, and when you think about something like that, which may include, uh, well, quite, bigger data sizes, I think that's also coming to today's topic. So I think there's a quite famous quote um, that premature optimization is the root of all evil. And I believe that's also what we see, or I guess at least what I see often in the, in the context of R. So if you have someone transitioning their work maybe from Excel to R, it's most of the time because they're 
well, whatever they've been doing, the data sizes or the, the complexity of the calculation that they want to do outstrips uh, what Excel can easily do. And therefore what they're looking for is um, to be very fast. So I think they're, what they're finding is that, oh, Excel can't do it or Excel is very slow. So now I need to find something that's very fast and they look for the thing that is the most performant to do what they do. At the same time, I think the truth is that uh, at least for typical problems, you probably don't really need to think that much about optimization. There are other considerations that are much more important than that. But uh, what we're talking to do about today is, uh, let's say there's what you call the critical 3%. So what can you do in those few rare cases where you've actually identified a real need to, to be fast and uh, you would like to use R? And I think that also brings us to one of the common challenges. Say, I think R has been designed for flexibility. So it tries to, to be able, well, it tries to enable you to do many things. And that flexibility, particularly in the sphere, well, with the, well, on the, with the perspective of meta programming, so programming with programming, something that enables many of these, um, I guess, very powerful tools that we have at our hands today, particular things like the tidyverse are only possible because R is quite flexible and you can express what you want to do in various different ways. At the same time, I think, uh, which is just a fundamental effect, if you try to be very flexible, then you're probably not the best at something. So you cannot be the most flexible and the best specialist at the same time. So what you would expect or what the truth is, R is also not that fast, generally speaking. But at the same time, I think it can be fast enough for most of the things that people actually do. So here's a particular example of a relatively well-known benchmark. And as you can see here, um, there are many different uh, well, software or the programming languages or packages, libraries in, that are being compared. And the comparison is for typical database like data manipulation. So you want to group some data by some attributes. So maybe you want to sum over all the values in a particular country. So you had more granular data and you want a more or less granular aggregation of it. Here you can find that, so, oh yeah, there are some frameworks or some libraries like Polas uh, written in a programming language called Rust and mostly used from Python. And then I guess the famous data table written in C, mostly used from R, but also other things like um, data frames in Julia or real database system like ClickHouse and also the infamous Spark. And what you can see here, maybe R isn't the fastest option. And this data is also by now slightly old. So clearly depending on what you're doing and how technology involves, the exact ranking will move around. But I guess what I take away is that um, R can probably be fast enough. So while it may not be the fastest option and for a particular problem or a particular point in time, it probably is um, fast enough for what you actually try to do. And on top of having this sort of performance on paper, um, uh, also gives you several different tools to improve the performance of the code you're working on. So starting with the, let's say more documentation or the general tips and tricks component of it. So I think there's a very good uh, ebook from Hadley Wickham, Advanced R. In particular, that book also has a chapter on um, performance tuning in R that I've linked uh, in the slides below. So there you can learn some general tips and tricks or some general ideas about how to tune the performance of R in general or how to adopt some patterns or workflows that are generally believed to be faster. But on top of that, I think there are also very many very practical tools um, if you want to make your R code faster. 
One of them is the, uh, is relates to code profiling. So essentially you have a script or a piece of code, or you have, I guess in most cases written a function. And now if you have um, determined that your function isn't fast enough, so you want to see which parts of that function are very slow. So say your function or this example here is uh, five or so lines of code or only four lines of code. And you don't really know which of those is like the expensive one that slows you down. You can use uh, a tool like ProfVis or code profiling visualization to um, see which of those lines is actually the ones that you spent your time on. And this mini example here, there's quite clearly a single line, the fitting of the linear model that spends all of your time. So if you want it to be faster, that's probably where you have to look to improve. And assuming that you're trying to, uh, or you've come up with some alternatives and you try to compare compare them or see like, oh, as with many things, there are quite a few different ways of achieving your goal. And then it becomes about what is the most appropriate for this situation. And assuming that you're driven by the speed or the how fast the, the code executes, then there are tools like the bench R package or micro benchmark R package that they give you very easy tools to just uh, run a line of codes or like run your function and see how it compares to alternative ways of achieving the same goal. And based on that, you can make your choices. But uh, on top of these tools and ways of just thinking about making your code faster, I think it's also quite important, uh, quite important to keep other um, components or other ideas in mind at the same time. In particular, what may happen is that uh, your quicker code is more complex. And yeah, complexity is hard to measure. There are some sort of quantitative guidelines like cyclomatic complexity, which have been developed mostly in the computer science uh, space that try to measure how complex uh, a piece of code is. But there are also dimensions, as I mentioned, like uh, if in the R uh, universe, tidyverse is very popular and there are millions of people across the globe who know, tidyver know the tidyverse and let's say deplier, then a piece of code written with deplier is probably generally thought to be less complex than some other piece of code written in some niche package that only a thousand people in the world know, simply because uh, many more people are familiar with it. and the next person reading it has a much better chance of uh, getting it quickly. Similarly, I think that the more straightforward aspects like just how many lines of code have you written? Uh, if you have like a, a faster piece of code, but you need to write twice as many lines, is that really worth the cost? So the next person coming in needs to read twice as many lines of code and uh, well, which give you many more opportunities to introduce mistakes those who just take uh, the next person much longer to get up to speed. And uh, maybe they never really fully understand it because they don't have enough time to read all the code. And on top of that, I think there's also next to the codes, how well um, is it documented and how user-friendly it is. So I guess that's both on the level of what you're using. So if you're losing, so using some existing R package in your code, how well is, doc is that documented? and how well-known and user-friendly is that? And also the code that you produce yourself, you clearly have to make sure that the person using it can also easily feel comfortable with it. With that, um, going back to our specific case study, I've, well, I'm going to show you four very short snippets of code just to make that a bit more tangible with uh, many different popular ways of achieving the same or very similar goal in R. The, as I already mentioned, it comes from some case study that we did around uh, having relatively large data sets of uh, a few tens of millions to 100 millions of rows and wanting to do some calculations on top of that. And one basic piece of that is uh, just um, for an insurance company or reinsurance companies to calculate how much risk are you exposed to. So, how many of those policies are active at a particular point in time or which uh, sort of um, period does it belong to? 
And yeah, as you can see, it's uh, relatively, well, uh, it's only a very small snippet of that and also a simplified version of that. That's so you see there's no error, no input checking or error checking or anything like that. So it's just some simple parts of the logic. And as you can see here, if you use a deployer version, that's relatively straightforward. I've uh, also just split it into two mutates because the first one is uh, maybe a bit more complex with an if else because you're filtering on some specific rows. But the remaining part is very much straightforward. So it should be relatively easy for the next person to understand what you're doing here. So you just have some date and you do some date manipulation. You extract some components out of it or calculate some minimum and maximum with something else. The, I think, typically next uh, more complex version that can be fast already is then a DT plier version or data.table plier version. So for those of you who don't know it yet, there is a, a nice package called DT plier that tries to give you the best of both worlds. So it gives you the nice syntax of the plier by also allowing you to um, get some or gain some of the performance improvements that data.table is typically known for, and that also showed that I've also shown at the start. And here you can see this version of achieving the same thing. Some things to highlight is you can see it at the start, I need to introduce additional line of code to set my data to a data table. I also have that. Uh, lazy DT line of code, so a lazy data table that I need to introduce. And I need to be a bit more careful about uh, my mutations or if I want to use a um, newly created column in the next mutate, I have to make sure that I split up those mutates. And at the very end, I need to add an S data frame. But broadly speaking, this is roughly at a very similar complexity while um, only introducing a little bit of overhead, which may already give you quite strong performance increases. Then looking at maybe the next most complex version is a real data table code. And again, there are many ways of achieving your goals, but uh, here you can see uh, there's a lot more going on. So there are many more brackets. There are um, but mostly empty, sometimes non-empty uh, row filtering. Then there's the data.table y argument, as you can see. So assigning new values to columns in place. So there's definitely a lot of more complexity, a lot of more brackets going on. And as mentioned earlier, if you if you have a, like an experienced data table user, then that may not be more complex than the deployer version. But uh, given the sort of relevant, the relative prevalence, um, it's probably easier to have the deployer version or the DT plier one than this data table one. <clears throat> Finally, I think uh, the sort of, let's say, benchmark that we created for this uh, simple case is then also a version that utilizes RC API. So C is. Uh, as a separate programming language that is mostly known for its simplicity and speed. And that's also what R is based on. And you, you can also utilize that in your code if you want to. At the same time, as you maybe can already see here, is, um, the code becomes quite a bit longer. So I had already redact quite a few more parts of it. And you only see a small piece of the calculation compared to what you did on the previous um, lies on the previous versions. And uh, here you can uh, see that maybe the R code itself becomes very easy because you only call some C function instead. But uh, in the C functions, then uh, there's a lot of overhead. You need to include some uh, header files, also called C header files. You need, to, in order to be fast, um, deal with these so-called open, well, can deal with the OpenMP framework, which is a parallelization framework. And then you have a lot of more complexity and so on going on to achieve the same thing. But it can be much faster. So you, all these options are available to you, and uh, you can all, all do them in R, but be very fast. 
But I think what for me is uh, the the most important takeaways uh, is that yeah, R can be very performant, and you can in many cases also scale scale it at least to a reasonable sizes. So at least uh, I think there are discussions about the sort of petabyte scale of uh, some technologies, and I think that's not the sizes that we typically see in insurance context, but what the data sizes we actually encounter are can be very performant and scalable. And that can also, you can use, you can use it just uh, with one of the easy tidyverse tools. So you can add a little bit of sophistication with data table or DTplyr to get more speed out of it. And also I think being performant is relatively well supported in the Arc ecosystem. So you have many other tools at your disposal like the ProfWiz uh, code profiling visualization tool I mentioned earlier, or the bench and micro benchmark tools to, to give you some ideas about how to be faster if you really have determined that you need to. But at the same time, yeah, you definitely have to be mindful of the trade-offs that you're making, that the uh, sort of speed is, is not the, well, most of the time, the sort of last of your concerns. So only once you know that you're doing the right thing and uh, you also have great confidence that what you're doing is uh, easy enough for the next one, next person who has to look at it to um, take a look at it and understand it and maintain it. That's uh, that's when you can think about speed. With that, I think that brings us to the end of the presentation part and I'm happy to take some questions. Parents, can I ask a question if uh, until we are waiting for other people to post their questions? Yeah, maybe it or, makes sense why people are typing. Uh, uh, can you please comment on the performance of R itself when it comes to discussions around uh, R being a single threaded? programming language and what that means in practice and how this can be uh, uh, essentially in, the impact of that can be uh, mitigated somehow. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. So you think it's um, R itself is single threaded, what's called single threaded to essentially can run one line of code of R code one after the other. Whereas I guess a multi-thread example would be able to execute two or more uh, lines of R code independently of one another in parallel. So at the same time, um, I think uh, that the the which well, so broadly speaking, sort of being single thread is an effect and it makes programming easier because you know that like line five gets executed before line of si uh, line six and uh, that will always be that way and there's no um, no sort of risk of things getting jumbled up. At the same time, as already uh, mentioned, there are packages or frameworks like data.table uh, that are actually multi-threaded themselves. So while you can only run a single line of data table code, data table itself is a able to to parallelize its computations over as many CPU cores as you, as uh, you have available. So it could be that uh, while like on the highest R level itself, um, 
uh, maybe single threaded, you can still utilize the sort of power of your computer on a lower level. Similarly, there are other um, frameworks like uh, the parallel package or a future package, which also um, use other approaches to try to or to give you some different ways of parallelization with an R, while R itself is still multi-threaded on the highest level. You can utilize some multi-threading or some more performance underneath. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, maybe going to the questions, I think we have on the first one from an anonymous attendee. Um, do you have any experience with parallel computing using R and could you share some best practices? <clears throat> I think that very much fits into the question that uh, George just uh, highlighted. So I think one of, so generally speaking, as I mentioned, uh, I'm personally uh, also a, a regular data.table user. And as mentioned, if many of the operations that data.table uses are already paralyzed in C code with that OpenMP uh, framework that I've just mentioned, you, you get the benefit of parallelization while on R itself being in a sequential single thread mode. So I think that is probably enough for most people. If you really, or if you are outside of the data.table world or related worlds and still want to have some benefit of parallel computing, I, I think there are, uh, again, the sort of parallel package or sort of also related packages like uh, the future per R or fur R packages that make it very straightforward. And I think um, with respect to best practices, um, that is a good question. Well, like uh, we have internally um, sort of developed some best practices and written them down of how we think people just really can benefit from multi-threading with the different packages that are available to it. With respect to general um, best practice, I probably say that uh, if, if you're using something like a data.table or dtplyr, you probably benefit from parallel computing quite well. If you need more than that, uh, looking into something like the fur R package and how it uses parallelization is a quite sensible step. And um, that hopefully is enough to get you started. Um, from Noel, I noticed that your samples didn't have any comments anywhere in the code. Do you believe only code that is self doc? Uh, do you believe in only code that is self documenting? And would you use comments to explain the functionality of some part of the code? Um, I think that's also a very good question, very uh, good observation. Um, maybe highlighting it, I think to a large degree, it is um, um, also governed by this sort of be being a presentation. So as I already mentioned, it's only a small snippet of the code that is uh, only highlighting some of the simpler functionality. And I would say if we have something like uh, um, the snippet shown at the moment uh, with the deployer version, I would probably hope that it is self-exploratory enough that there's no additional comments needed before, beyond that code, um, given that uh, the tidyverse and deployer tries to be very expressive already and that you also follow very reasonable uh, naming rules uh, for the domain that you're in. And uh, there's a um, good naming convention for the columns and uh, variables that they're using. Um, do I believe in only code self-documenting? I think there are different uh, schools of thoughts here. Um, I personally like to use uh, comments when when I do something that may not be completely obvious or um, as self-documenting. As I said, with something like deploy or tidyverse, we often benefit from very evocative wording like mutates and if else and other sort of names that hopefully make it quite obvious what you're trying to achieve. But um, I think there's some, some of the comments like uh, here and the C code saying that, oh yeah, here we're using OpenMP multi-threading that is maybe more op opaque and not as immediately obvious to a user. So most of the time, I think comments and code are useful if, if it's some sort of very unexpected behavior or whether where you do something that seems a bit odd, but is necessary due to some, let's say, yeah, do you um, 
it's still supporting some legacy behavior of your codes or there's some very specific configuration that is only important for special cases. So I think highlighting those is quite quite valuable. Um, otherwise, I'd probably hope that the most of the documentation of the code is done via good naming and good splitting of what you're trying to do. And then the part that I find very important is then the actual sort of documentation, let's say with R code that is often in the Roxygen uh, framework. So you definitely should uh, be or, or try to spend a lot of effort into documenting your parameters, your, what your function expects and returns and does, and also writing some examples. So I think that's very important because that's probably what most actual users will look at. Yeah, I hope that uh, um, gives you some answers to that question. And uh, I think a question from Archbolt. Could you please summarize the main approaches, tools, and techniques you use to improve performance of R? What runtimes have you observed in practice for more to complex models that use R? Um, I think with respect to tools and approaches, I hopefully mentioned the most important ones here. That's uh, I think that's the typical go-to. So I think there's the, as I mentioned, the education piece. So hopefully you've had some experience with R or have had the opportunity to read some of the nice material that many of the R community uh, produced to have some idea about what are typical approaches that normally yield to uh, yield fast or slow code. Uh, code. And once you're beyond that, um, I think as mentioned, the first um, goal should be that you have correct code that does what you want it to do, that is sort of solid. And I think also going to a previous code as a, but a previous question as well, documented and uh, maybe commented so that it's very understandable. And after that, you may look at if you actually realize and practice that the runtime isn't as good as you want it to be for your use case, then you can look at uh, some of the tools like Profis. So taking a very um, well, a real example that I had. So someone had written a function that was uh, yeah doing something in the loop. And uh, they essentially, the person says, OK, I run this function that takes uh, don't quite know anymore. So they ran it overnight, so and so many hours. And uh, that's too slow for my use case. Uh, can you take a look? So you run prof with over it, probably on a smaller sample because you don't want to wait eight hours every time, but you cut it down a bit so you can actually try it in a reasonable amount of time. And then I found a particular part that was very slow. And then I did exactly as described here. So for the slow parts, uh, I tried some alternative approaches of achieving the same. And again, uh, maybe I'm a data.table guy, but I, I found some alternative data.table approach that uh, reduced it from something that took several minutes to single seconds. And then after the end, the whole runtime went from so and so many hours to a few minutes. I think it was eight or something. So, And um, I think that's a very potent starting point. And, um, how to sort of um, find those uh, alternative approaches. I think they're normally Google or any of these, uh, again, quite strong open source um, contributions from people like Hadley Wickham are quite important to have some idea about typical issues and faster alternatives. Um, I mean, the last component about runtimes, complex models, I think for me, that's probably very difficult question to ask, uh, to, to answer, given that just what a model is, is very divergent. So a model could be a very simple deterministic calculation, maybe like what George showed. And there you can run your um, expected monthly installment model uh, for a few hundred or thousands of policies in a minute. So that's probably good enough. Um, there are other models where having like a single realization, well, probably not a single, but a thousand realizations from a complex Monte Carlo model can already take you minutes to hours. And I've seen both. So yeah, I I probably would say there, um, developing code takes time. 
So you would have to come across something that's very slow and um, used often enough that's to make your um, investment into better code actually useful. So if you have something very slow, but you only run it once a year, probably doesn't matter. It's very slow. If you have something very slow and you run it twice a day, then that may be a worthwhile investment. Okay, we have uh, another question from Jinye. Um, hey, Benedict, do you have a view on good use cases of RCPP? Same question for use of data formats that support partial read GPA. Okay. Um, that's also a very good question. Uh, and I think that there are probably different um, preferences uh, sort of um, coming out. Uh, so maybe mentioned in my introduction, and I've been using R for a long while. Um, in particular, I learned R when there wasn't was no tidyverse, there was not really a developed RCPP and so on. So I probably learned how to make do with base R and also the um, RC API. And with that background, I probably find alternative approaches like uh, CPP 11 more appealing because they have left less of the overhead of something like RCPP. So they're closer to normally writing um, C well, C or C++ code, but I can understand that um, depending on your familiar, familiarity with the different approaches and where you're at, that can be quite uh, quite different. And um, RCPP definitely makes it very easy to, um, to port a simple algorithm from, from R to some mostly equivalent C++ code. I think broadly speaking, where I find good use cases for this sort of lower level code is um, that you have some sequential algorithm. So essentially saying that you have a loop and the next iteration, the loop depends on the previous value. These can be more difficult to implement in a nicely parallelizing or a nicely vectorized way, depending on the exact calculation. So there it may be sense that you just take like the smallest part of this algorithm implemented in RCP, but with RCPP or CPP 11 or just the C API, just pick this small part of this algorithm with the loop to do, and then you still use the power of R with its uh, for the error error check, well the argument checking, the data checking, and all the niceness it does. For partial read and parquet, I think that's probably an easier sell for me. Um, so you, it's quite typical to have, or relatively typical to have very large CSV files or large databases. <clears throat> and then often what you want to do is some aggregation, or let's say you want to filter the data to only have it for a few months or a few weeks at a time. And there's that's typical use cases where Parquet pin can be quite nice. So I think next week I'm actually showing a use case that we had for that. So I'll um, guess leave the rest of the answer for next week's webinar. Um, okay, then we have a question from Michael. When considering whether to write more performant codes and moving from TTPly to C, do you think about implementing this at the start of your analysis? Only when you, or B, only when you run into performance issues or C, only once you are reaching the production stage? That's also a very good question. I think from my perspective, I probably don't think, so I think it also links nicely into the, the previous two questions. So <clears throat> I think a basic consideration for me is always how often is this code going to be run and how much time is there even to save by having more performance R code? So if you have something that takes one minute and you can make it much, much faster to one second. That's nice. But if uh, that is only being run, let's say 100 times total or something, so you saved 100 minutes, and how much code can you really develop in, uh, in 100 minutes? That's probably not that much. So you really need to first think about, OK, so how much time saving is there even uh, possible from running this code before you think about uh, investing a lot of uh, its uh, implementation. So I think that's probably speaks to the start of your analysis. So already the start, how often do you 
but how much saving could there even be from more performant code realistically? And then the other component is, um, I, I guess from experience, identifying kinds of code that are that R isn't as good as, or <clears throat> maybe slow to uh, slow in performing in, in regular R. I already mentioned so some sequential loops or so on that uh, that are not easy to parallelize or vectorize. That if you know that you are facing that and you run it very often, then maybe even from the start you're thinking about higher performance. But I think realistically the main part is really B. So so you have you have written correct code. It does what it does. It is robust enough, and uh, now you you find that overall running all of it is too slow for what your expectations and use cases are. And that's really when I, I guess, go into the sort of number two and number three shown on the slide here saying, okay, so where can we pick the specific pieces to make it faster to get within our um, expectations? Okay, then we have a final question from Ivan, which hopefully you pronounce correctly. To utilize object-oriented programming R in your real-world projects, e.g. R6 and S4, and does that have an effect on the performance? Um, <clears throat> to, I guess the, the easy question, uh, easy answer is yes to both. So I, I've personally used and seen used both as R6 and S4 and S3 in real life in S3 in practice. Um, and it has some effect uh, uh, the effect on performance. I guess here I'd come back to also what I try, tried to highlight already in the rest of the talk is that it has it probably has some effect on, on performance, but it, it didn't really matter in practice. So I haven't been utilizing like these, uh, so the object-oriented programming frameworks on in particular or the, the levels where it matters, the, the performance, the, wasn't really affected. So I guess to some degree, it's also like my personal preferences. I'm more sort of a functional um, guy instead of encapsulated object-oriented programming guy. So maybe the approaches I choose are already more geared towards functional programming instead of maybe having some agent network that I would try to simulate uh, in a sort of object-oriented style. And that is, um, on the other hand, Maybe I have some higher level structure written in S4, let's say, but then the actual long running part of it is, let's say, some data transformation or something like that. And that is then implemented in data.table, let's say, or dtplyr. So while there is some performance impact on the choice of using R6, S4, or just regular functions, the actual meaningful part of the performance is probably relegated to something lower level anyway. So the, it's probably not relevant to the performance discussions, at least not uh, what I've seen. Okay. So I think that brings us to the end of the questions. And I think we also have overrun our slot a little bit. So thank you, Eru. Thank you everyone for staying with us for this time and for the questions and interest and hope to see you again next week thank you everyone